Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Podmashensky. Lecture 12, Modern Art and Spiritualism. A. Now we'll finish by giving some other symptoms of the revolution and Chileism, which is the central theme of the modern age. Some Germans have seen deeply into this. B. Art. Decline from humanism to subhumanism. This writer, Hans Settelmeier, talks about the history of modern art, especially of the last two centuries, as bringing into Western art, Western culture, entirely new phenomena, which later on he'll interpret as to what it means. He discusses first the fact that in the 19th century there was no dominant style, but new styles seemed to come every decade or two. And the lack of a style he attributes to the fact that there's no common belief underlying the society. There's no sort of one thing which art is devoted to, as it was in the Middle Ages to the cathedrals. Then he discusses architecture, and we find that just at the time of the French Revolution, just before, there's this architect, Lido, who comes up with the scheme for a perfectly spherical building, not only as monuments, but also as a house for a sheriff, and giving a completely ordinary thing like that this very extraordinary form. And later on, this dies out because it's practically not possible. And then it comes back again just before and during the Russian Revolution in the 20th century. And there the idea is to overcome the sense of being bound to the earth. This is a chiliastic idea. Architecture also becomes unstable. And no longer do you see sort of a orderly building coming up from the earth rising up into the sky. Instead, it becomes sort of off balance, as though it's going to fall over. And finally, there is the idea of building as a machine. A house is a machine for living in, a chair is a machine for sitting in. This is in the 20th century. And we have this quote from Le Carbusier, one of the great architects supposedly of our times who even built a convent on these principles, a frightful-looking thing. He says, The heart of our ancient cities with their spires and cathedrals must be shattered to pieces and replaced by skyscrapers. And this is that very world which we living in cities must face. And not only does revolutionary philosophy affect us and revolutionary political systems, but also revolutionary architecture and art. Secondly, he talks about the torso, which for the first time in the middle of the 19th century in the sculpture of Rodin, by the way, many of whose sculptures are in San Francisco at the Legion of Honor, the idea of the torso is put into reality. Before then, it was only some kind of sketch. But now the complete fragment totally fragmentary thing becomes a work of art. It shows that the higher purpose of art has been totally lost. And now we come to the very striking sphere of painting, and he discusses Goya, who lived at this very time at contemporary with Napoleon, the late 18th, early 19th century. And about him he says this, the more we study the art of Goya, the more intense grows our conviction that, just like Kant in philosophy and Ledo's architecture, he is one of the great pulverizing, destructive forces that bring a new age into being. In Goya's art, certain characteristics force their way to the surface. They are symptoms of what have become the decisive trends of modern painting. But there's more to him than that. Court painter though he was, and officially working for the court, 
even as Lado still worked for the ancient regime, old regime, and dedicated his great architectural works to two monarchs, Goya nevertheless is the embodiment of the new type of the exposed artist in the sense we've discussed. The new element in his art has no connection with the public sphere, but derives from a completely subjective province of experience, from the dream. For the first time, an artist, taking refuge neither in disguise nor pretext, gives visible form to the irrational. The two series of his called Suenos, dreams, and Disparates, madnesses, are the real keys not only to his own work, but to the most essential thing in modern art. And Disparates are also the frescoes with which he decorated the walls of his country house, and not a few of his pictures. Here, for the first time, an artist has thought something worthy to be put on canvas, which derives directly from the depths of the dream world and the irrational. Nothing could surely be more mistaken than to suppose that these series were created to improve, or instruct the world, or to brand some politician. The elemental power of these visions would never be understood in terms of so innocuous and idealistic an explanation. Once, hell was a clearly defined province of the world beyond. All the hideous products of the imagination by which the human mind could be tormented were banished into pictures of that place and were thus objectivized. The eruption of hell into this world was a real and external thing, and it was thus that the painter would portray it in pictures of the tempting of the saints and of those dehumanized human beings that mocked and tormented our Lord. In the other case, however, the one here before us, this world of the monstrous, had become part of man's inner world. It exists within man himself, and this brings us to a new conception of man, insofar as man himself becomes demoniac. It is not merely a matter of his outward appearance, it is that the man himself and all his world have been delivered to a demon empire. Man is on the defensive. It is hell that has the overwhelming power, and the forces that man can marshal against it are feeble and despairing. In the visions of the Suenos, his dreams, and so-called proverbs, and proverbios, we see every disfigurement by which man can be made hideous, and every temptation by which his dignity can be assailed. We see demons in human form, and beside them bewitched creatures of every kind, monstrosities, ghosts, witches, giants, beasts, lemurs, and vampires. Kronos devouring his children seems like a nightmare personified as he squats, a naked giant on the edge of an oppressed world. And yet, this pandemonium of unclean spirits has a kind of raging vitality. These are no creatures of artistic fantasy. These are bloody realities that have been personally experienced. The date of the Suenos dreams, of which several of these are examples, this series of paintings, is 1792, when the French Revolution had reached its climax. It was at this date also that Goya had a severe illness, the nature of which we do not know. These are the decades when many artists seem to have been possessed by demoniac powers. The sculptor, Messerschmitt, repeatedly portrays his own face as a hideous, grimacing mask, while the ice-cold art of Fusli in Germany 
shows indications of unmistakable hallucination. This is the time when Flaxman saw the devilish face which, for some inscrutable reason, he called the Ghost of the Flea. It is also the age of Mesmer, 1733-1815, through 1815, the age when occultism was highly fashionable. It was as though a door had been opened in man, a door leading down into the world of the subhuman, the world which threatens those with madness who have seen too much of it. There is a second artist he talks about who is quite the contrary, but also reveals this very similar thing. A painter called Friedrich, a German painter of this time. In his painting, the human warmth has gone out of man's relation to created things. The moon, itself a dead body, coldly reflecting the light of the sun that has set, veiling the world in a shroud, is the chief symbol of this new feeling that man has about them. Man feels himself abandoned by God. He is as much alone in the universe and as unrelated to it as is the crucifix in Friedrich's picture, standing in the vast impersonal silence of the mountains. The third aspect he talks about in this age is, which is very symptomatic, is the caricature. About this he says, The caricature was not totally unknown in previous epochs, but it is only from the end of the 18th century that, starting in England, caricature became widespread and was recognizable as a clearly defined branch of art. It is not till the 19th century that, in the work of Damier, the French artist, it could become the main field of activity for an artist of the very first rank. It is therefore not the appearance of caricature as such that constitutes the decisive historical event, but its elevation to the rank of a respected and significant art. After 1830 there appeared in the periodical La Caricature a publication with a clear political intention, a Walpurgisnacht, as Paul Valéry calls it, a pandemonium, a satanic comedy, riotous to the point of debauchery, now pure tomfoolery, now avid with the lust of blood. These words give us an insight into caricature's spiritual paternity. Its essence is a distortion of the human, though it occasionally does more. It sometimes invests human nature with the attributes of hell, for it is in the nature of hell to create images, by which our human nature is insulted and belied. This distortion may be of the most varied kind. Man, for instance, can be distorted into a mask, and it is significant that Damier's work as a caricaturist should begin with that. In the main, however, there are two methods which this process of distortion employs. One negative, the other positive. The negative method takes from man his dignity and his form. It shows him as ugly, misshapen, wretched, and ridiculous. Man, the crown of creation, is debased and dethroned. But for all that, he still retains his humanity. But the positive method of distortion makes a wholly different and subhuman creature out of man. In doing so, it pulls out the same stops that have always been used by the portrayers of hell in Western art. Man's features become a grimace. He is turned into a monstrosity, a freak, an animal, a beast, a skeleton, an apparition, idol, doll, a sack, or an automaton. He appears ugly, a thing to excite misgiving, an unformed creature an object grotesque and obscene. His actions assume the character of the nonsensical, the absurd, the insincere, the comic, 
the brutal, and the demonic. The primary impulse behind it, this, is doubt or despair concerning man as such, a denial of the goodness or beauty of human nature. The conventional form of caricature is merely a pretext under which this view of man can be freely unfolded. In Damier's case, of course, and this distinguishes him from the much more savage and cynical caricatures of the beginning of the 20th century. His lack of confidence in man is outweighed by a recognition of his greatness. Damier saw the grandeur of man as did scarcely any other artist of the 19th century. Grandeur and absurdity are merged in him, and so beget the tragi-comic. When the beginning of the 20th century was reached, however, that saving balance was to disappear. There was to be a new and supreme flowering of the merciless type of caricature, and one which at heart wholly despaired of man. But now the distorted picture of man that had begun with ineluctable power to take possession of the artist's mind was to show itself without disguise in the human types produced by the art of the day, types which strike simple folk as the most terrible of caricatures, and which indeed do proceed from the same dark caverns of the soul as does the caricature itself. And before this, in the 18th century, there is still an ordinary normal idea of man. You paint portraits, that is. Somebody pays you, the nobility pay you, you paint their portraits, there's a function for it, even though it's not religious, it's not particularly profound. It's still art, has a definite place, a function, and you can recognize the human being, and it's often very well done. There's a sense of the three dimensions. This kind of art is perfect in its own way, and now all this is dissolving into, by these, the torso. The demonic enters in, the caricature, or else icy coldness. All these are destroying the very idea of painting as some kind of thing related to human beings. Now he discusses briefly the art of Cezanne and modern painting. The art of Cezanne, then, is a borderline affair. It is a kind of narrow ridge between Impressionism and Expressionism, and in its unnatural stillness, prepares for the eruption of the extrahuman. What this leads to is that man, again contrary to all natural experience, is put on one level with all other things. Soon after Cezanne, Surat was to represent man as though he were a wooden doll, a lay figure or automaton, and still later, with Matisse, the human form was to have no more significance than a pattern on wallpaper, while with the cubists, man was to be degraded to the level of an engineering model. The painting of Cezanne was pure painting, that is, first the Impressionists came and they sort of dissolved things into what is for the moment. No longer any idea of the way things should be or a deeper idea behind it. Just the way things appear. If horses are galloping, it is with, you can see, all 20 different feet instead of just four feet. And they want to present, just capture the moment. They are influenced by photography, of this whole idea of reducing art just to this moment. And they were very charming things, some of them, but you can already see that reality is dissolving in them. And Cezanne said that he wanted to take Impressionism and make it a classical art, and therefore he took it and sort of froze it. And in fact, this man even says that his art is the kind of thing you see when you're just barely opening your eyes and you're half asleep. And this is not art but a momentary thing which is very dangerous. And here you can see his landscape, which is, it is no longer sort of a landscape. 
you can still see its landscape, but now it's very sort of strange. It's sort of made geometrical. He said his idea was to make it into something geometrical. The Cubists simply tried to take reality and to chop it up into pieces and to take the separate pieces. Instead of having a face, a whole face, you take your face and the eye here and the cheek and the mouth and so forth and sort of glue it back together. And it looks extremely weird, as though you are taking reality apart and then just partly putting it back together again. The art is divided up actually into two categories. One is the very rationalistic art, which takes pieces, things apart, and barely puts them back together. And the other is very expressionistic. Someone gets an idea and distorts like crazy in order to get across his idea. And it eventually ends up that he just stands in front of the canvas like this Jackson Pollock in front of a 20-foot canvas. He gets inspired, throws paint, and he gets $10,000 for it. And sometimes you can see there's a definite pattern. He has some kind of inspiration, because the world has order in it. And a person can sort of, if they're really interested in art, maybe they can give some kind of pattern to it. I know one religious painter, in fact, I think he's a famous painter now. Went to college with him, Sombach. He said he wanted to paint religious things and how, in order to paint, he looked at the crucifix. He got the idea and then threw things onto it. Comes out some kind of ghastly distortion of Christ on the cross. At this point, the behavior of these allegedly pure painters borders on the pathological. They begin to suffer from that diseased condition whose essence is the mind's inability to project itself into the minds of others or into the world outside. When that condition takes over, everything seems dead and alien. Man can then only see the outside of things. They are no longer conscious of human life and others. It is also at this point that the whole world begins to become unstable. For when things are mere phenomena that have no meaning inherent in them, then they begin to be experienced as things without stability, things fleeting, wavering, bodiless, and indetermined. They are solid things no longer. This may explain why those who wish to see a world in flux are automatically driven towards absolute painting, the painting that is innocent of any meaning whatsoever. The kind of painting that began around 1900 and dominated the 20s is not only contemporary with modern, technicized architecture, it is not only preceded, like the latter, by a kind of prelude around 1800, it has a deep connection with it, and all over Europe and beyond was favored and propagated by exactly the same groups by those namely that were the carriers of the spirit of 1789. The two things go together, despite the fact that the original architecture is so cold and objective, and the new painting is so wild and irrational. One reflects the other, despite the fact that painting and building have been wholly separated from each other. For a painting no longer helps to give form and character to a particular space, as the decorative fresco of Art Nouveau still attempted to do, the picture has become something belonging wholly to itself. It is no longer even a stationary patch on the wall. Rather, its character is that of a book, which we open and put away again. Le Corbusier, the theorist of the new doctrines, the architect, declared that all pictures should be kept in cupboards and that they should only be hung on the walls for a few hours, as the spirit happened to move us. He found the stable picture intolerable. This kind of painting was, for a long time, a subject of acute controversy, which makes a cool appraisal extremely difficult. Yet the verdict of its most adverse critics 
is not so damaging as a purely historical interpretation. For this brings at last the questionable character of these efforts to light by the simple process of describing them. The inner relationship between this kind of painting and the modern building of yesterday is shown first and foremost in their common desire to dissolve the old orders. As there are now buildings in which top and bottom are no longer clearly distinguishable, so there are pictures in which top and bottom can be confused with one another. That is of course a purely external symptom, though it is an extremely eloquent one. It is, moreover, something quite unprecedented in the history of painting, unprecedented even in its most daring aberrations, and it is an indication of the extra-human, inhuman character of this form of art. In saying this, we have really come into possession of the key to the understanding of modernist art in all its phases, for these really only differ in the means employed. All the new ways of looking at the world which this modernist art brings in its train are fundamentally extra-human, even in an outward and superficial sense. The photography, even of the 20s for instance, is marked by a tendency to avoid the normal view of human personality, and falls back on a few mechanical formulae. It favors pictures taken from above or below and from unusual angles, lighting effects that break up the subject, and distortions as in a distorting mirror. Of course, in the film you see the same thing. All kinds of experiments to see how you can break up the picture or show different pictures next to each other to make some kind of striking effect. In doing this, it merely goes along with the essentially extra-human trend in painting, which gives clear expression to its spiritual attitude. Every art, of course, in greater or less degree, takes the world that it finds and departs after its own fashion from our normal experience thereof. Of this, in order, thus, to create it anew. But modernistic art is driven by an ungovernable urge to pass beyond the limits of the merely human. This explains how the normal themes of pictures of the mid-19th century take on a kind of an extremis, extreme aspect, in which man appears to surrender his essential humanity and begins to see things as a man sees them in delirium, or in a nightmare, under the influence of drugs, or under that of incipient madness or extreme terror, and these states on the edge of madness, produce visions of the most astonishing kind, the visible world, the world of actual forms in portraiture, landscape, still life, and every other kind of painting even in what is still alleged to be religious art, becomes alien, distorted, and horrible. The nature of its ordering becomes unstable and resolves itself into fragments. Form disintegrates, becomes fluid and chaotic. In some cases, man and his world are transformed by the rigidity of death. Familiar things become strange and living nature becomes nature morte, still life. It has been said of Greek art that it was harnessed between two mighty powers, which were perpetually at its side, and with which it ever had to strive throughout the whole of its existence, in order to assert itself at all. These two powers were chaos and death. The new painting, in its maniac desire to shake off the fetters of the merely human, had admitted these powers into art, and with them a third, which the Greeks did not know, and which it was left to the Middle Ages to bring into our lives. That power is hell. All this chaos, death, and hell 
are antitypes of humanity. The representation of a world which these three powers have distorted is the essential matter of the new painting. The proximity of art to death and its kinship to the atmosphere of death, the atmosphere which makes all things cold and rigid, is not something without precedent in the history of art, something that is only superficially formulated by the terms romantic and romantic movement. When this phase occurs, an exalted nocturnal view of life, of nature and antiquity, breaks out of the depths of man's being. But through it all, man's dignity has been preserved. The proximity of death in the German Romantic movement, as it is experienced in Gilly, in Beethoven, Kleist, Holderlin, Novalis, Runge, and Friedrich, is tragic, but it is still human. In his surrender in art to the now unapproachable sum of things, Man asserts his law against chaos, which for him is a reality that he knows only too well. In the modern phase, however, there is combined with the consciousness of death, which in a thousand forms lurks behind all living things, makes its awful presence known in a faded flower, in an empty room, yes, even in a still life. There comes now a torturing doubt as to the dignity and the very nature of man. That doubt may resolve itself into an agonized acceptance of negation, or turn to a positive and cynical distortion of his being. Here the proximity of death is no longer tragic. It is something infernal. It is an affirmation of chaos. And it is all the more terrible because there is no province of life that is entirely immune to this eruption of the netherworld. Once, hell was a clearly circumscribed domain that stood in contrast to a universe that had meaning and reason. But by an almost similar aberration as that which, in the 19th century, caused men to see the gleam of heaven and the natural light which shone down upon all things, so that even a load of hay was transfigured by it, there now erupted into reality the most terrifying visions from the antechambers of hell and from the circles thereof. The coming of these visions was a thing unknown to those who conjured it, but they came for all that. Nothing is immune to their influence. Whatever belongs to horror and to night to disease, death, and decay, whatever is crass, obscene, and perverse, whatever is mechanical and a denial of the spirit. All these modes, motifs, and aspects of the inhuman take hold of man and his familiar world. They make of man a ruin, a automaton, a mask, a phantom. He sinks to the level of a louse, an insect, in the various movements of modern painting, it is always one or the other of these various anti-human attributes that is underlined. Cubism lays the emphasis on deadness, expressionism on boiling chaos, surrealism on the cold demonism of the last icy regions of hell. Even if the actual works had been lost, the very titles chosen for the pictures by the men who painted them would be sufficient to betray their spiritual home. Fear, Sick City, Dying City, Moribundus, Mon Portrait Squelettis, My Portrait as a Skeleton, Plague Above, Plague Below, Plague Everywhere, The Joke Has Conquered Suffering, The Dunghill, back into nothing. The interpretation here adopted may at first sight seem fantastical. Yet, if we look at the matter objectively, we will find that it does just what a theory ought to do. It explains a multiplicity of data which we have till now had to try and understand one at a time. It allows us to recognize all the various isms, 
from futurism to surrealism. They are all, in one way or another, a flight from the higher reality, as expressions, which only differ from one another on the surface, of the same basic powers. For although human nature and all its manifestations is always essentially one, its denials are many. Such a theory, in a word, allows us to see through all the differences, including the minutia of details and technique. There is, to speak in purely aesthetic terms, a genuine art of the horrible and the infernal, nor is this most dangerous artistic potentiality by any means to be denied. It has lurked behind Nordic art from its very beginnings, for it was Nordic art that produced the image of Christ disfigured in death, a thing unknown to the art of Eastern Christianity, as it also produced the picture of hell. Bosch, Bruegel, and Grunewald raised this art of the horrible to the same level that it attained in its most transfigured and exalted forms, while Goya widened its scope without for a moment deserting the province of true art at all. And indeed, we find on the threshold of this new art of inward death and hell, a number of artists whose genuine artistic power cannot possibly be denied. Ensor, Munch, Kubin, Schiel are but examples. Van Gogh, Munch, and this Munch we saw this cry Surat, the pointillist. All born about 1860 are the first painters in which this new thing is apparent, though they have not yet completely surrendered to it. It is only in Ensor, also born in 1860, that it becomes all-pervading. For those born after 1860, it becomes their destiny. Long before the First World War, it revealed the nightmare that was riding Europe in its great cities. After the war, a definite artistic decline set in, and it is now that the symptoms of extreme degeneration come into evidence. With the new objectivity, the most dead and banal form is attained. Regarded politically, this newest and latest art is the ally of anarchy. Psychologically, it is the expression of an enormous fear and a hatred of the human race which men turned against their own persons. The most profound explanation of the artistic abortions which now came into the world phenomena had already been given by Goya, who wrote under the title page of his collection of paintings called Suenos, El Sueno de la Razón Produce Monstruos, Dreams, When Reason Dreams, Monsters Are Born. And we see this is when reason comes to the end of the Enlightenment. There erupted into human life, irrational forces which come from the demons. Actually, it says, El Sueno de la Razón Produce Monstruos. The dream of reason produces monsters. And finally, he talks about surrealism. The leading theme of surrealism is chaos absolute. The movement seizes upon it wherever it can be found. In the dark regions of the world of dreams, in hallucination, in the deranged and irrational character of ordinary life, in that department of reality in which things that have no intrinsic connection with one another have been brought together in a fortuitous, senseless, and fragmentary manner, be it in the confusion of a great city, or in that of total war, or in that of a junk shop. The junk shop's treasures seem to fill the surrealists with quite peculiar enthusiasm. Their subject matter may be loosely defined as the chaos of total decay, not the chaos of creative potentialities, but that of finality, not the chaos of things coming to birth, 
but that of things finished and done with, not with the chaos of fruitful nature, but that of the unnatural, a chaos from which, as Goethe says, the very spirit of God himself could hardly create a worthy world. There is no gainsaying in the movement's power of this movement of surrealism. Of all the trends of the 19th and 20th centuries, apart from the new building, only two, contrived, managed to survive the Second World War. Positive realism in painting and this same Seuss realism. There are already surrealist cells in many countries, and not in European countries alone. Compared with it, Expressionism represents an altogether negligible minority. No purpose is served by belittling such a phenomenon, nor should one comfort oneself with the pretense that such things are mere extravagances, follies, or forms of some strange spiritual gain. Even as early as 1860, Dostoevsky prophetically recognized in his people of the abyss, that such types as those which surrealism has brought to full flower had inevitably to come into being, given the circumstances in which our society has developed. And in the last resort, surrealism only represents the final acceleration in the downward rush of man and art. That downward rush, of which Nietzsche was already aware, when in 1881 he wrote, Der Tolle Mensche. Are we not continually falling, backwards, sideways, in all directions? Do top and bottom still remain? Are we not wandering through infinite nothingness? Is not the breath of empty space in our faces? Has it not grown colder? We see here interconnection between philosophy, politics, and art. He makes some conclusions. Our diagnosis of modern art is further confirmed by the undeniable fact that modern art finds no difficulty in portrayal of the demoniac and of man himself turned demoniac into a demon. But it finds insuperable difficulty in showing us man as a human being, and it fails utterly when it comes to the God-man and the saint. Modern art, the attraction that is exercised on the artist by the extra-human and the extra-natural by darkness, unreality and the subconscious, by chaos and nothingness, has about it all the qualities of an enchantment. Paul Klee says, Our beating heart drives ever deeper towards the ultimate ground of things. The disturbance of modern art extends to man in all his different aspects and relationships. There is the disturbance of man's relation to God. In this sphere of art, this is made more palpable than anywhere else by the nature of the task that now absorbs creative energy. An energy which previously had been absorbed by the temple, the church, and the sacred image. Man's new gods are nature, art, the machine, the universe, chaos, and nothingness. Now he talks in general about this whole movement from the time of enlightenment to now. In the pantheism and deism of the 18th century, a gulf was opened up between man and God. At first, the idea of God seemed much purer, more pure, than that of a personal God. Our notion of God became divested of what seemed to be an anthropomorphic element even as that element was expelled from architecture. What happened, however, was that this god of the philosophers evaporated into nature and vanished. While this was happening, something was also changing in the idea of man, 
which was divested of its theomorphic element, even as God had been divested of the anthropomorphic. The result was very different from what had been intended, for man by this process was reduced to the level of an automaton, when he was not reduced to that level of a demon. The loss of God as a reality destroys the original sense of reality as a whole. Having lost that sense, man turns into an anti-realist, into an idealist, a being living among phantasms, which opens up the possibility of the devils to come. Father H. Imagination. Father Seraphim. In the radical form of deism, the divorce between God and man arises from the fact that God is relegated into the far distance, so that God and the world begin to be regarded as distinct and wholly separated things. God is the absent God, who created the great clock which is the world and duly wound it up. That clock now continues to run according to its inner laws, which means that the world unfolds itself automatically. This excludes the possibility of any personal relation to God. All mystery is eliminated. Indeed, the chief work of one of the protagonists of deism, Toland, is called Christianity, not mysterious. As we already saw, everywhere spiritual relations now grow cold. Their place is taken by the frigid relations of reason. Doubt plays an ever more decisive part, and everything that feels the touch of his coldness is transformed. The world becomes a world machine, man and Hama machine, a man machine. About this, who was it, Aviki, I think, wrote the book at the time of Voltaire. And the state becomes a state machine, Lado. Remember the architect who made the round, the spherical buildings he wanted to make? Who was doubtless an adept in this particular type of religious sentiment, asks as he contemplates the earth. This round machine, is it not sublime? Man now becomes as isolated toward his fellows as he is towards God, and as isolated towards nature. He is, as Lido himself says, isolated everywhere. We must thus infer that deism stands at the origin of those varied phenomena which are characterized, above, as a tendency toward the inorganic. Its effect is everywhere deadening, and it makes men strangers to God and to each other. So actually this art does have a religious background. It has a background first of deism. Next we have pantheism, and he discusses this in the poet Holderlin at this very time at the turn of the 19th century. The individual figures, part human and part divine, in whom Holderlin worships the divine, namely Christ, Heracles, and Dionysius, resolve themselves into a nebulous something, that is, so to speak, pre-divine or super-divine. He prays to something that seems to him older and more holy than the figures of the personal gods. The great holy thing, which Holderlin recognizes in nature, is nothing that is close or familiar to man. He cannot, as it were, feel his way into it. He cannot discover himself in it, nor, as the past age was able to do, can he look on nature as a kinswoman and a friend. The great holy thing is none of these things. Rather, it is something that wholly lacks a human character, or even an organic character, a thing that has neither personality nor destiny. It is something that is the very opposite to the nature of man. It is the universal thing. 
a thing that cannot actually be felt and is infinite. Holderlin likes best to designate it as stile, quietness or silence, thus contrasting it with the busy activities of men. In order to approach it, man must first destroy himself, he must go to his death. And finally, he gives a sort of summation of all these destructive, dark influences as they have been in the history of Western art. And although he himself was a lover of art before the revolution, that is, up to the 18th century, in this little history of his, he shows very well that these destructive influences go right back precisely to the moment where we discussed the beginning of the apostasy, that is, the 12th century. The first outburst of this demonic element, he says, occurs in the late Romanesque. It is in this phase that the sacred world is suddenly endowed to a quite terrifying degree with a demoniac character. Thus, in the doorways of various cathedrals, the sacred figures have the appearances of corpses and of ghosts, a thing that can in no wise be explained by a certain remoteness from humanity that marks the art of the High Middle Ages. Christ sometimes resembles an Asiatic idol or an Asiatic despot. The apocalyptic beasts and the angels are all distorted by this demoniac quality. This curious phenomenon cannot be explained in terms of the dual intention that is discernible in much medieval art. The intention to administer a certain awful shock to the beholder and at the same time by means of the sheer absurdity of the visible symbols it created. To spur his mind towards purely spiritual contemplation. For directly beside the sacred figures, and in the very midst of them, and indeed scarcely distinguishable from them at all, are images of demons and of demoniac beasts and chimeras that even invade the interior of the church. At the same time, the figures themselves begin to acquire a most remarkable and unprecedented quality of instability. Those on the great arch above the door of the cathedral at Vesele seem positively to be tottering and look as though they might crash down at any moment from the great curve on which they have so precarious a footing. This is the period when figures began to be tangentially affixed to the frames of the great doors, and it is to this period that belongs the great wheel of fortune that lifts man up and, ineluctably, casts him down. And it is to this period that belongs the great wheel of fortune that lifts a man up and, ineluctably, casts him down. And it is this period also that for the very first time stands architectural forms upon their heads. All this is the visible expression of that instability of human affairs that people have suddenly begun to feel with a peculiar and painful intensity. It is in fact the visible symbol for the dominant mood, the dominant feeling about life and the world. In religion, the dominant emotion is fear. The principal theme is the day of judgment, expressed to the uttermost potential of all the terror it can inspire. In the crypt-like gloom of the church, we can with our mind's eye see the faithful standing in fear and trembling before God. Never has the mysterium tremendum, tremendous mystery, attained such force over men's minds. So, already for some reason, art begins to become unstable. Although the main Gothic tradition goes on with its great cathedrals, still he senses here some kind of instability. Why? Because they, at that time, began to realize that they had lost orthodoxy and the artist is more sensitive than other people. 
this begins to come out in him. And when orthodoxy is lost, the demons begin to come in. And therefore, the demons directly inspire the artists. Then there's a second period, which is that of Hieronymus Bosch. In the Romanesque period, the demoniac world had really not yet achieved a separate life of its own. It is only in the Gothic that light and darkness are divided, and the cathedral indirectly brings into being as its polar opposite to the heavenly kingdom, which is shown forth in itself a kingdom of hell. Even though this last remains essentially still a subordinate thing. Then, thus, as the representational art of the late Middle Ages develops, we begin to get painted representations of hell. The culminating point of this development is to be found in Hieronymus Bosch, who flourished between 1480 and 1516, around 1500. Bosch, a contemporary and an actual co-equal of Leonardo da Vinci, created the world of hell as a kind of chaotic counterpart to the new cosmic art of the High Renaissance, which we already saw, this idealistic, chiliastic painting. And what is entirely new about Bosch's infernal world is that it has its own creative principles, its own chaotic structure, its own formal laws, and it is really these that make it into a true counterworld to the worlds of heaven and earth. It is only since Bosch that we have anything like a picture of hell made visible. There is definite novelty in the very shapes of these creatures from hell. They are not fallen children of men, who by a simple process of metamorphosis have turned into beasts of the devil, but they are wholly independent and as yet unknown forms of life, born of the marriage of every conceivable kind of creature, fish, beast, bird, witch, and mandrake, the products of a kind of ungoverned cosmic lewdness and debauchery, in which even lifeless things can mingle with the living, all this was something that lay wholly outside the horizons of antiquity. New also is the actual scenery of hell, and we see aspects of the face of this earth which had never before been put on canvas. We see here dark gulfs, empty stretches of earth and sea, that seem to tell us how utterly God has forsaken them, the desolation of empty cities, strange, hideous places whose vegetations are gallows trees and wheels of torture, slime and morass. Here are neither sun nor moon. Such light as there is comes from vast conflagrations or from the iridescence of strange, phosphorescent shapes. Hell can show us the work of human hands, but it is distorted rid in decay. Above all, we see ruins, we see them continually, and in hell there are also arsenals, a fighting equipment of strange machines, pieces of apparatus that are often meaningless, though sometimes they have a meaning, being instruments of torture, while through the air sail airships, demon manned and demon piloted. So long, however, as the world of Christian belief remained an effective reality, and at this time it was still real, that is, Catholicism was still real, and even Protestantism had something left of Christianity. So long as the world of Christian belief remained an effective reality, the outlook behind such painting must be interpreted as a vision of temptation. The picturing of hell therefore remained, to some extent, hemmed in by Christian orthodoxy, and it was thus only to be expected that it should attain its full freedom and develop its most extreme forms 
when art has finally left the Christian world behind it. It is therefore wholly logical that Hieronymus Bosch should have been rediscovered in the 20th century and should have become one of the original parents of surrealism. In Bruegel, and we showed you, in Bruegel's work, there appears another dominant theme of modern art, the depreciation of man. Man is looked at from the outside, as something distasteful and strange, much as we might regard creatures of another planet. Seen thus, men appear base, unlovely and perverse, clumsy, inane, and absurd. Creatures, in fact, possessing every quality capable of exciting contempt. And this is true not only of the peasant, of whom the late Middle Ages tended rather to take this view, but of man in general. In the art of Bruegel, several undercurrents of medieval art unite to form a new picture of man, one which represents him as the very antithesis and negation of holiness, greatness, nobility, and wisdom. The world of man, the world in which he must act and live, is a world in which all is done wrong, a world of chaos and wholly without meaning. Lurking about him everywhere are the creatures of hell. Death and madness lie in wait all around him. It is moreover a matter worthy of a special note that Bruegel pays such particular attention to the things which are the special preoccupation of modern psychology and the modern mind in general. For his interest is drawn in a remarkable manner, not towards the peasant alone, the analogy here is with our contemporary concern with the primitive, but also to children, half-wits, cripples, epileptics, to the victims of blindness and intoxication, to the mass, and to apes. Even quite ordinary things have a spell cast over them which makes them look strange to the point of being unintelligible. Much as Bruegel's beekeepers look like walking tree trunks, so that a game played by children looks like some weird new manifestation of lunacy. This brief glance at the past makes it clear that what was to become a general disease in the 19th century was coming gradually into being right throughout the development of the West and at various times overtly showed certain of its symptoms. And he concludes his book by saying, it may be a somewhat questionable proceeding to designate one's own age as the turning point in the history of the world, mankind. Nevertheless, it is difficult to shake off the feeling that since 1900, a kind of limit has been reached and that we are faced by something wholly without precedent in the entire world's history. Beyond this limit, it is difficult to imagine anything except one of two things, total catastrophe or the beginnings of regeneration. Of course, what's coming seems to be a kind of combination of the two. This concludes the reading of the first part of Lecture 12 from the Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Pod Mashinsky. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe Click the notification bell to be notified of any new posts, and comment below, and you can check out my Patreon in the description. Thank you, and God bless.